Welcome to Classroom 5.0, a podcast that uncovers industry insights, cutting-edge research and practical evidence-based strategies that help us all to imagine and design learning environments and pathways for this ever-evolving world so that together we can best support the next gen to uncover and deliver their unique potential. This episode has been recorded from our hometown of Port Macquarie, which we're grateful to share and enjoy alongside the traditional owners of Beer Pie Country, whose ongoing cultures and connections to lands and waters we celebrate, and whose elders, past, present and emerging, we pay our respect to. I'm Marianne Power, co-founder of the Posify Group, and I'm beyond excited to be bringing you today's guest, Ben Grosier. He's here to share the ups and downs of a life that every teacher entrepreneur and parent will most likely relate to, along with the incredible impact that he's creating with the next gen. Today, Ben is the co-founder of Class Cover, a company that saves over 2,200 schools and 75,000 teachers vast amounts of time and stress when they're managing relief teaching staff. Their Relief Teacher Association also supports thousands of casual relief teachers with accredited PD and support, and their latest initiative, Home Teacher, connects casual relief teachers looking for additional work with parents looking for homeschool support or online tutoring. When it comes to learning, Ben, with that introduction, I reckon you've pretty much got all bases covered. So (laughs) welcome. It's great to have you here. Yeah, really good to be here, Maz. That's a... um... Yeah, hearing hearing that back is always pretty humbling. It's uh, yeah. Thanks so much. I'll for, bet. Thanks for the intro. Oh, you're so welcome, and I'll bet. And it's also very inspiring um, to the likes of myself and Jen. And you know what our listeners probably don't know is that you and I met and Jen met um, for, from a uh, I guess a treasury pitch competition that we did last year. And you were very heavily involved from that entrepreneurial aspect of mentoring and guiding us as we really pulled our messaging together. Um, and although that sort of sits in the entrepreneurial work, you know, it's also in your guest lecturer work with Charles Sturt University. It seems like teaching's in your DNA, whichever way you kind of outlay it. Tell me a little bit about that. What got you into teaching? Why does it drive you? Oh, uh, yeah, you're right. Education's always been um, part of what I do and who I am. Um, my mum's a teacher. Mm. Um, I have teachers huh. all around me. And um, I I love the idea of taking an amount of edu- uh, amount of content or an amount of information and and working out how to deliver it in a way that's engaging and in a way that's um, able to be uh, enjoyed and, and absorbed by all sorts of people um, it's something that I sort of drifted towards when it came to you know, my, my later years in high school I'd played a lot of tennis and um, got a tap on the shoulder to do some coaching and and so then ended up in a school in in Sydney and then ended up running the tennis club over in the UK for five years and and you know as part of that there was um, some time working in some of southeast London's rougher schools and um, and all of that was education and educating and and it, it just always um, just really uplifted me and inspired me and um, and where I find myself today is still in education doing all sorts of different things and I, I still love every, love every minute. Yeah, and so much of what you've said there just sort of set off a couple of little light bulbs for me and it's something I've been getting curious around and it's this role of teacher and I guess in our minds or our stories that we've had, particularly in the Western world, that that's quite formal in its structure and that there's that system where there's the teacher and there's the student and actually your life is is really singing to where I think we're moving. I'm curious to hear your thoughts around that actually we all have a role in terms of education and um, that kind of intergenerational aspect I didn't know about your mum though. Can you tell me more about growing up? Like, what was that influence about? Yeah, so I mean, interestingly, especially with the stuff we're doing, the Smith family. My mum was um, one of the first, uh, or, or was, was teaching one of the first integrated classrooms with children with additional needs. Um, yeah, back in the seventies, um, out in Mount Druitt in the west of Sydney, and you know, to have. I think what the, most of the time it was autistic children come into the classroom and and to have them in in what we used to call sort of mainstream school I guess um, was uh, really groundbreaking and and really challenging at the same time and she has a, a lot of stories about about those challenging times but but just always being so fulfilled by the impact that she was having um, in in later life after my sister and I had grown up a bit. She went back into teaching um, and ended up being in learning support and just has some incredibly amazing stories about kids who um, were were really challenged by their by their disability 
um, and then went on to do amazing things after school and have been in touch with her as adults, um, you know, since that time. Wow. So, yeah, she's had, she's had a big impact and, and that, that really, I, I guess, sort of um, intersected with my dad being a small business operator and, and I guess if you look at my background, um, my dad was running a, an 85-year-old small business, fourth-generation small business in manufacturing, so our, our, we lived and breathed that business had mum in education and I was sort of a mix of the two, which I guess sort of makes sense. It does make a lot of sense now. And what a beautiful mix it's been as well. I mean, one of the things, or lots of things I admire about the work you're doing, but it's that focus on, on connection and, um, and yeah, and, and relationships. And it sounds to me that growing up that that was also a, a focus for you in terms of your family values. Um, I, I'm wondering in terms of that relationships piece, and I'm, I'm very conscious I'm throwing you in the deep end here now, but how are you seeing relationships transform both in your role in schools or, or talking to teachers who are in schools, but in terms of learning as a whole? Yeah, look, I, I think education and, and homeschooling, the, the lockdowns, the pandemic has, has taught us a lot. Um, you know, yeah. I, I don't want to sound like a, um, you know, like, like I was some sort of you know, exceptionalist when it came to homeschooling, the challenges of having kids at home. I was sad to see the kids go back. I, I loved homeschooling. Um, the kids wanted to go back, by the way, and and I was very, very, happy, <laughs> I was very, 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 very happy for them. But I, I think for someone who's grown up in education and in a family with an educator, um, it was always going to come a little bit easier um, this, this time with um, our kids at home. But when you ask about the relationships and, and how they've changed, how, how teaching and education has changed, I would like to think that the homeschooling has built a huge amount of additional empathy in our in our parents, in our non-educators, in the media yeah. about what it means to educate a child. And um, yeah, absolutely. it's funny, I've spoken to a few people in the last couple of weeks about what a pandemic, what school lockdowns would have looked like if it was when I was a child. So let's say sort of mid late eighties mm. and when the educator world was very much still what we call chalk and talk, it was very much still worksheets. It was um, really what I'd call kind of one dimensional compared to what the kids get today. And I actually think if the, if the lockdown had happened, if the homeschooling had happened in the late eighties, it actually would have been, it would have been almost in some ways easier for the kids because, because being given worksheets to complete, and sort of sitting quietly and doing things in quite a rote way was normal. Was kind of normal. Yeah. Whereas what a, spend, yeah. a six-year-old who who goes to school in a brand new building, he doesn't have a classroom. He has a hub. Yeah. He basically wow. has a sort of five-star. This is a, this is a, a wonderful public education. Uh, um, you know, a government school, by the way. Um, but he has a hub, which would have five different areas. He interacts with up to seventy different kids um, in his hub. And that compared to the best of the best that we could manage at home was still chalk and cheese. You know, it, it was. Yeah. And so these kids now are being taught to be critical thinkers. They're being taught to be lifelong learners. And, and that's, for an educator, the end goal. And that is regardless of what you've taught a child, whether it be in a given day or across 13 years of education, you want them spat out at the other end to be um, in love with learning. And, and just to be endl endlessly curious and to be a lifelong learner. Um, and, and I think the schools are doing that so much better because they have engaged with critical thinking, emotional intelligence, empathy, um, all these all these skills that I really detest being called soft skills in the mainstream media. Yeah. I honestly think they're the, yeah. they're the superpowers. Um, and I, I think the schools have really embraced that. So that, that that's where that's where mm. relationships and um, – and, and what our educators are, are doing and connecting uh, or how they're connecting with our kids is, is looking at the moment, in, in my opinion. Yeah, that's fantastic to hear. And I'm curious because I think there's almost parallel conversations going on that I've been watching. And I know many of our listeners will be familiar with, and I think the use of the term soft skills is still around uh, an education piece, if you like, of seeing the relevance in education and how and why or where it should be combined with some of our more traditional technical skills or, you know, literacy and maths and where it probably needs to be a standalone. Um, and I'm curious because I'm hearing from industry that there's an impression that these skills aren't being woven in 
to our education system. And yet you're reporting the opposite of that, that actually that's the point of difference. I wonder if you can give our listeners a little bit of a glimpse into some of the best practices that you're seeing some of these schools adopt and, and how they're implementing this new way, if you like. Yeah, to put, put your teacher hat on, I think that way, the way the education changes as a teacher across 13 years of a, school, of a child's education is that it, it's this sort of sliding scale where, where kindy, you're 95% parent, you're 5% educator. Um, and, and by that, I mean that what you're teaching is more in that sort of parenting role. When, and of course, there is, you know, with, with you're doing your, your literacy, your numeracy, there's an education um, element to it, but it's all hugely wrapped up in just loving and caring for these um, curious, you know, quite helpless little human beings. And, and 22 of them, you know, 23, 24. <laughs> yeah. um, and then as you go up through, yeah. up, as you up through schooling, the, the parenting starts to reduce and the, let's call it the hard skill sort of education starts to increase. And, and I think the primary schools have really transitioned. So when, when you ask about what you hear, what you say about what you're hearing from industry, I think that very much things have changed primary school level. We've moved away from rote learning. We've moved way more towards critical thinking, again, emotional intelligence, um, even even things like digital literacy, media literacy, um, to always be questioning. Um, that's very much embedded now, I believe, in, in primary school. In high school, probably a bit more to, more to do there uh, in that there's still a focus, a very exam-focused, um, not, not box-ticking as such, uh, and things have gotten a lot better. But because of this HSCN goal, which ultimately is a, um, as we know, it's, a, it's an entrance score, it's a, and, and it's an entrance score that's largely the university um, uh, you know, entrance criteria is sort of based on supply and demand, and that's what dictates if you need a higher or lower HSC score. Um, I think there's work to do there when it comes to preparing kids for what life looks like after high school. Um, and, and that could be, again, I think it's a, um, there's a need there for whether it be entrepreneurial mindset, there, there's a need for um, you know, self-reflection, having a new approach to careers counselling, for example, and, and having, uh, I guess, sort of being kind to yourself as an 18-year-old, a 17 or 18-year-old, that you don't have to decide what you're going to do for the next 50 years in the next two months. Uh, you, can, yeah. you can try different things. There might be things that you like or that you're good at that you never realised that you liked and you're good at. And it's all about expanding your mind and expanding your, your horizons. Um, and I don't think they've got that quite right at the pointy end of, of education. Um, it, it's very hard to be um, everything to everyone at scale. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. And so it's um so there does need to be a a structure and, and that might look like multiple choice that, that still remains in some examinations today, which is as we know, it's a terrible way to examine um people and terrible way to, to, to measure um capability. But there's there's pragmatisms about that. And um there's when you've got forty thousand HSC kids to put through an exam, then then there needs to be an eye on practicality as well. Yeah, and I'm also hearing you say that there's room or scope for a look at proportionality as well. So how much of a proportion of our high school students' experience in their learning as they move through that more structured, explicit content, how much can we afford to to put in a bucket over here and free up some space? And as you were talking, light bulbs are going off in terms of imagining a future where perhaps we we bring more of that parenting role into the high school yep. environment. Yep. You know, what does it look like to have those implicit lessons around modeling? Mm -hmm. So you know, you see me do something, you do this, you test it out, we reflect on that together. Um, I'd be really interested to, yeah, to, to get in a to get in a brainstorm and test that out with, with a bunch of of humans who might be keen. That's really important, really relevant. And I think it, it's sort of we, we refer to young children especially, it takes a village to bring up a child. We don't kind of have that yeah. mindset in those high school age children. Um, it's very, and, and if you look at parent involvement in high schools, it is, it's tangibly less um, in high school than it is in primary school. And again, there's a good reason for that. The kids, the kids might not have as much interest in their parents being involved in their education, but, um, and it might not even have to be huge amounts more of parent involvement, but more just 
adult involvement that is um, that is those other than the classroom teacher, and and it, and it might be to have people consistently throughout the six years of high school to be to be coming in from industry, you know, or, or those with who are who are experts with entrepreneurial mindset, for example, or or those from the you know, the frontline services, and and to always be um, again whether it be modelling or or giving little insight into what their vocations or, or their careers look like so you're not just having this really sort of out and out sprint towards a whatever they call it just like the uat what is it the the uat whatever they call it now um but it's more of a okay that's one component but i've got i've got myriad options here um because i've learned these along the way and i want to be like Maz, or I want to be like Ben, or I want to be like that paramedic, or I want to be, um, you know, what my parents did. Uh, and, and it's, again, it's that broadening of horizons. So I think it's super important. Yeah, absolutely. The broadening of horizons, the broadening of mindsets. And to your point, offering children vehicles or access to be able to see different role models and give them the space to be able to imagine themselves That's in right. a future forward, yeah. but multiple different possibilities. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's been interesting as we've started to explore that role of peer-to-peer and mentoring for older children because I think you're right, they don't necessarily want to just go to their parents and developmentally mm-hmm. speaking, they're building their own tribe. And so I'm curious as we all start to explore what learning looks like as we move forward, where that space is, does that happen on school grounds? Is it a co-curricular? We all know we've got a super crowded curriculum. Have you got any thoughts about from a space perspective how we could start to explore some of these concepts and ideas? My first thought on that is something I've believed for a long time, and is, is a lot of people sort of sleepwalking into tertiary education, and and that's because there is a, um, you know, there, there's a lot of, um, you know, lot life is full, or you, or we're all surrounded by people who are signalling and, and projecting, and and that's to say, well, yeah. it might be because the car they drive, the clothes they wear, or in fact the university they attended, or the fact that they went to university. Now, um, for many for many families. It, it's pretty much mandatory that their children go on and do tertiary education. However, I think that's not necessarily the best way to approach things. There is there is many, many different options post-school, including just taking a bit of time after a very, very intense period of your life to, to reflect, to work, to travel, to meet people, and, th- and then come back into um, what your next step is. Um, in, in relation to the space that you, you talk about, I think from a figurative point of view, first thing we got to do is we got to make the space um, by saying, hey, you're not a failure by not going to university. And, and so firstly, we clear the space for the conversation about what's next um, because all of high school is it used to be, are you going on past year 10? Yes or no. And basically, if you were dropping out at year 10, there was stigma attached. You were dropping out. You weren't, Absolutely. You weren't finished. Yeah. Um, yeah. A lot of people took a very well thought out approach to ending their education in year 10 and going on to be very, very successful people in their own vocations because they didn't require an HSC. Um, and, and that happens again at year 12. And at, at year 12, it's a case of going, all right, um, effectively, you've failed if you're not off to get a degree three months after the most intense life uh, year of your life. So, I think in that lead up, and it's really a you could argue it's a six year lead up, but let's say it's a two year lead up, end of year ten, year eleven, year twelve. I think it's um, it's making it possible, making it feel all right and okay and acceptable to be contemplating. Um, a life post school it doesn't necessarily look like tertiary education it might but in that two or three year run up to provide those options and that could be with an enhanced approach to work experience for example Mm, work experience the way I remember it was two weeks um, kind of you know in year 10 I I love I love my work experience but at the same time was again tick tick done move on never to be spoken about again and, and I think there needs to be a um, almost a cadenced approach to making sure that our older kids are aware of what is out there in the world for them. Um, in relation to where does it go in the curriculum, 
I've said, I've said to you, I've said to many, many people over the years, if your education service or product does not result in a net reduction of teacher workload, then it will never go anywhere because the teachers are completely at cup over, overflowing state and status. Um, and so I think that we create the space by partnering with people who will benefit from meeting and working with our young adults, our, you know, our older children, but those partnerships can also alleviate some pressure off our educators as opposed to... Absolutely, so they can get back into the classroom right. and do what they do well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Really, it's a case of saying um, to, our, to, to our educators, you know, you've previously, you know, if society's gotten a problem, if society has a problem, give it to a teacher to fix it. And, and it might be road safety, it might be sex education, it might be, it might be health and nutrition. But I think we need to engage a community, and this is also around career. Um, we need to engage a community to, to serve the dual purpose of taking some heat off our teachers and better, and better assisting our students. And as you say that, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm hearing a message and I want to check it out with you. And, and I don't think it needs to be a criticism, but more of a call to action that if there's a problem coming from industry, then where's the solution? And so what's the responsibility that industry can take in actually extending that pipeline and meeting students where they're at, at that really highly influential phase um, where they are wanting to get in and demonstrate all the different possibilities that are available to them? Because there are so many, but to your point, Teachers can't do yeah, it all necessarily. Right. Right. I mean, they're incredibly committed and, and enthusiastic to give it a go, yeah. but there's only so many hours in a day. Yeah, right. yeah, it's really interesting what you're saying there. I like that call to action for industry. I, I hope they're hearing and I might follow up, I think. <laughs> Coming back to that idea of so many different options as people leave school, I mean, one of the hot options is this idea of becoming an entrepreneur or a socialpreneur or an entrepreneur or whatever preneur you want to become. And I'm curious, given that you work in that space, both as an entrepreneur yourself and helping others through accelerator programs, what are your thoughts? I mean, it's it's kind of been highly glamorized, hasn't it? That there'll be this overnight success. And you and I both know that that's not the road. And that actually where I used to complain about having to wear so many hats, I almost feel like a conversation with somebody around, hey, if you want to look at this, part of the geek is that you will be wearing this many hats. So how do we upskill you? Where are the gaps? But what are your thoughts? Are the next gen ready to truly be stepping into this as an option as we enter this gig economy phase? Uh, yeah, I think I think they are. I think the the biggest the, the biggest um, enemy roadblock, whatever you want to call it, is stereotype. Mm -hmm. And and I, I talk about yeah, signaling okay. and projecting. Signaling and projecting happens in in startup in entrepreneurship all the time. Tell me more about that. In what way? So entrepreneurship and startup is is massively over-indexed with what I call white male and 40. And I'm white male and 43, so I, I, I fulfill the exact stereotype. But the, the, the word startup, the word entrepreneurship has been hijacked by the, the sort of the dream of going from, you know, zero to a billion in revenue on a, on a high, high growth, high risk, um, you know, tech platform rocket ship. Now, I was talking to someone the other day about about trying to unlock the thousands of years of of advice of uh, of knowledge that exists in our local community here on the northern beaches, and, and by that I mean business knowledge. Mm. And yeah, and, and to come out of COVID, we need to try and collaborate more. We need to try and get um, these people who have deep experience or maybe big networks to help businesses that that need assistance. Mm. And entrepreneurship could be something as simple as a cafe owner who wants to transition into a wine bar so that they can have a, a, a longer window of customers, more revenue, et cetera, et cetera. That's a new product offering, a new service offering. Now, in 2021, a lot of people would say, no, no, that's not, that's not entrepreneurship. That's not startup. Um, startups, you, you, you build a software platform. Or, or you raise, or you raise, yeah. or you raise a million bucks, or you you work at a co-working space. Again, white male and forty. Um, now, to me, that needs to change, and and this is why I love working with regional entrepreneurs because the, the diversity amongst regional entrepreneurs in in New South Wales, as I see it, is in, incredibly rich. And what that means is that you get people coming from different backgrounds, 
um, different nationalities, different genders, um, and and therefore it's it's not a it, it's it's not an echo chamber. It's a it's an it, a, it's a literal ecosystem full of different ideas um, from people with different backgrounds. So, in relation to our kids and an entrepreneurial mindset and and how do they embark on becoming an entrepreneur? They have, they have to drop a stereotype. They have to understand that that entrepreneurial mindset will be well used in an employee um, setting. And, and we know the word entrepreneur and I hear that around all the time. Um, and, 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 yeah, that's, you know, I'm, I'm okay with the, the, you know, that jargon and those words. But at the same time, just always be applying um, an approach to whatever you do with a creativity and a sense of lateral thinking to try and do things more efficiently um, or um, more easily, uh, more profitably, uh, and, and that, that's the epitome of entrepreneurship. So it's kind of um, it's kind of broadening the term or broadening the definition of it so that people feel more comfortable embarking on it. And uh, I think that's the first step. Yeah, I like that. It's almost redefining the positioning of entrepreneurship as we move forward. And to your point of the term entrepreneur, for some of our listeners who may not have come across it, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ben, but it's it's a term that's been adopted by industry in the sense that you might be employed to do a specific job in a specific, um, I guess, role or department, but you might have a little side hustle where you can bring in some creativity and innovation, design a solution, whether you're collaborating with a not-for-profit or a social enterprise uh, that's outside of your organization. Um, and and I like your idea there, or I think where you're getting to is that rather than trying to redefine or you know reimagine what that looks like, is it not just that we want our employees in industry and therefore our next gen to have an entrepreneurial mindset and be placing that wherever it is and on what project? Because surely that same level of innovation on their own gigs within their own department are going to be as beneficial from the lessons that they've learned over in their side hustle. F- for a, for a social purpose enterprise is is that kind of your yeah. thinking as well or, yeah, I mean, or did you and, want to pick and, up from well, that? it can it can be absolutely that and i think entrepreneurship um is is really yeah it's it's being in that sort of salaried usually it's a salaried position and and, and that's one of the yeah that's the biggest difference there's a safety of exactly. the salary that's that big, that is a very big point of difference <laughs> and and again yeah but it's a really important point to make because we all have different. Yeah. We all not not to go off on a tangent. But we all have all different risk profiles, and and yeah. entrepreneurship requires a, a, a very thorough examination of your own personal risk profile. And if you're a cafe owner who wants mm. to turn your cafe into a wine bar at night, because it'll, it'll yeah. you'll get more return on investment on your rent. Um, obviously, you'll be open for longer, make more money. There is a calculated risk involved in that, and and for some, mm. that risk might be too great. For others, they might go, oh, that's a complete no-brainer. Why wouldn't you try that? That's someone who has a, a, a higher risk profile. Now, if you're going to quit your job and start a startup and go without income for 18 months, that's someone who's way higher up on the, on, on the risk sort of scale. And with entrepreneurship, it's being able to bring an entrepreneurial approach but in a low-risk environment because you're going to get paid at the end of every month um, just like you do um, in, a, in, in a, again, in, in day-to-day employed, employed settings. And so it's a really good way for people to flex their muscle around creativity, again, lateral thinking, being agile, uh, deploying a new product or service, but within an organisation where you're obviously not going to reap the benefits of selling the business or being acquired or mm. shareholder return, but at the same time, mm. you get to um, de-risk yourself personally whilst, yes. whilst being, um, I guess, free to explore, again, new products and services um, internally. I think that's a really important distinction. And I know I heard you say that, you know, at the risk of going off on a tangent, but for me that that point about the risk profile is really significant, particularly as we start to look at this idea of how can we have conversations with our high school students around preparing them for that vision, if you like, of what after school would look like, because it's a self-awareness piece, isn't it? And 
having young people reflect on, you know, what their own risk profiles are, um, what kind of lifestyle that they want to create for themselves, I think really helps to inform what path they're going to take as they start to explore some of these, um, as we said earlier, soft skills or transferable skills or 21st century ways of working. It's really interesting. But speaking of risk profiles, one of the things that I love, I want to dive into that you've done with Class Cover is your work with the Smith family. Um, and the surprising outcomes I remember us talking about that, that you explore there. Um, I'm going to let you, I'm going to throw over, tell us a little bit about how that initiative came about and what you found as you were working with the families. Yeah. Yeah. That was, um, I mean, first and foremost, most fulfilling project I've ever done in my entire life. Um, and the the, the Smith family, um, catch up learning project in a nutshell is connecting, um, casual teachers who want some after school, out of school hour work with, uh, disadvantaged kids who who um, are in need of some remedial education, so catch up learning as we call it. Uh, it came about, yeah. funnily enough, the the pandemic hit and the schools shut down, and our casual teachers, um, especially on the east coast, a lot of them lost their work immediately. And so obviously there was they were, they were hurting, and there was a lot of panic, as we know, as we remember about what this pandemic was going to do to um, our society, our economy, the whole the whole box and dice. So. Um, we also saw, and I was one of them, we also saw parents who were were struggling to cope with the, the rigours of, of home learning and balancing a full-time job or a business, et cetera, et cetera. So in really quick time, um, we built a, a lean um, marketplace to connect casual teachers wanting work with parents wanting homeschooling support, and we called it, called it Home Teacher. Now, as we know, lockdown one, at least in New South Wales, which is 70% of our market at class cover, it was over before it even started. The kids are back at school within about three or four weeks, I think. And so we had a couple of clients and it was it was going pretty well, and uh, but we weren't setting the world on fire. And we thought, okay, well, we'll, yeah, we'll sort of park that one because we're, we're back to normal now. Um, and then we got a, got a contact or we got a, a message from a couple of charities in Melbourne. And uh, they basically pitched us an idea where we would connect um, our casual teachers wanting more work with some um, disadvantaged children uh, that were involved in their, in their charity and got that to a point of almost sign-off and then the Victorian government changed their funding criteria. It was all wrapped up in the hotel, hotel security guard scandal and their funding criteria. I didn't realise yeah. that. Then, wow. Yeah. So uh, their, yeah. their funding criteria ruled out labour hire agencies because that was what the problems wow. with the hotel security guards, you know, being recruited by WhatsApp, yes. very little vetting, all that sort of stuff. And so probably rightfully they, they panicked and, and all that went went to dust. So it was, it was a great idea mm-hmm. and, and, and uh, it was great exploring it but it amounted to nothing. So I worked with the Smith family back in, 2008, 2009, um, as you mentioned, I, I ran the, the Toy and Hamper Appeal as they were transitioning out of being a welfare charity into an educational charity. And the Toy and Hamper Appeal was their sort of centrepiece for the Smith family. So they, they retained it for quite a few years after they went into education. Um, so I picked up the phone and, and gave um, uh, Wendy Field, who's a national partnerships manager at the Smith family there, a call. And and said to her, hey, look, we've got this concept. You've got 56,000 kids on your Learning for Life program. We've got, um, we mentioned 75,000, I think we've got about 91,000 casual teachers now on the platform, a lot of who identify as being underemployed. What do you think? And do you think we can do something here? To their absolute credit, they signed off on a pilot, 60, uh, 100 kids, 60 teachers, 6,000 hours of tutoring over a 20-week period, and we got it up and going in four weeks. And so we're teaching our first sessions a month after I picked up the phone to Wendy. And we're so pleased to say that the the educational outcomes of these children were just incredible. We had kids whose reading age improved by three years in 20 weeks. Um, you know, and we're talking about kids who were 10 who had a pre-kindy re- reading level. Um, you know, we had a young, wow. a young young man from regional New South Wales who didn't, when asked in the pretest, um, "What's the name for a baby cow?" as a kid from the country, he didn't know, and he was and he was eleven, and and so wow. that gives little indication of the comprehension skills, let alone the family um, situations that a lot of these kids were in, and so we had these spectacular educational outcomes, which are great, um, but there were also these second and third order effects, and and that was that the confidence of the parents 
increased greatly. Um, the, the teachers took on almost an advisor role to the parents about how to communicate better with the school. Because if you're an illiterate parent or if you're a, from a um, non-English speaking background, um, it can be very intimidating to ask a classroom teacher or a principal about your child's education. And, and so the, parents and the teachers sort of took on this advisor role that they weren't just teaching the children, they were also supporting the parent. And the overall love of learning, both in, in the entire family unit, was just so profound. Um, skip forward to July, they, uh, they'd signed off on 150 kids for next year, 100 teachers, which is super exciting. And then the Smith yeah. family, in all their wisdom, published a data and research report that hit a lot of, because they're high profile, it hit a lot of um, sort of, I guess, sort of uh, the, the high parts of government and, um, and business. And mm -hmm. the federal government got in touch and, and long story short, they are now funding 530 kids, uh, 250, 275 teachers, 32,000 hours of tutoring uh, to start February next year. So a 500% scale up. So... Um, really, really big outcomes. Yeah, really exciting. And what I love about that story, and I hope everybody listening is taking it away as well, is that systems thinking approach. So yes, on the one hand, you know, when we talk about risk, you've got yourselves as, as entrepreneurs coming in and saying, hey, here's a possible solution. Industry taking a punt and saying, let's give it a go. Uh, bringing the merging of minds together for the original objective, which was let's just try and catch our kids up, academically speaking, to then see the ripple effect of that and the impact that it's had on, on families. And as a psychologist, I can then assure you that intergenerational drip on effect that's going to happen Absolutely. as a, the, there's a building of confidence in understanding of all of the reasons why learning is helpful and not a hindrance and something that we can move towards collaboratively together is just something that I know beyond February of 2022 is going to live on in a really special way. Oh, it's massive. I'm, I'm such a big So thank you for sharing oh, no behind the scenes. No yeah, and I hope it's inspiring others to start thinking who are within their networks that they can also collaborate with as we all start to imagine this future learning pathway ahead of us. We've touched just briefly in our conversations about the risk of burnout for both teachers and also in the entrepreneur world. And part of that does come down to that risk profile and the overcrowding that we all know of. Um, and I want to lead into a bit of a game as we finish up. But before we do, I also know that you're very heavily invested in supporting through your own professional development with your teachers, making sure that they've really got that mental health piece captured. What are some of the best practices you're seeing or tips or strategies that you'd like to share with any teachers who might be listening or entrepreneurs for that matter about this self-care conversation? For me, it's pretty simple. Um, it's, it's simple to say, harder to do, um, but things, yeah. like, things like get enough sleep, do some exercise, try to eat pretty well, drink plenty of water, um, you know, try, try to keep a lid on the, the alcohol and caffeine intake. Um, that's where it all starts, and and that that is super important. There's a uh, there's someone who um, I quote all the time. It's actually Mark Zuckerberg's sister of all people, and and she said she wrote a tweet once in maybe back in 2012, even 2014, and she said, "You want to be an entrepreneur? Um, you can to be an entrepreneur. You can choose three of the five things. You can't basically have everything. And and the five, if I can remember them correctly, was one is the business, two is family." three is friends, four is fitness, and five is sleep. And she said, pick three out of five of them and that'll set you up for some level of success as an entrepreneur. I think that is complete rubbish. I, I am. Oh, I'm glad you said that because I'm thinking, okay, because I can fit a whole bunch more buckets into that bin. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Don't get yeah. me wrong. I struggle to juggle, yeah. but there's way more yeah. buckets than five. And, 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 <laughs> and I think it comes down to, yeah, and, and this is, I think we talk about stereotypes in, in entrepreneurship and it being hijacked by a stereotype. Mm. We have all these entrepreneurs who are trying to deploy and deliver innovative products and services, but their mindset is actually quite archaic. And that is that they're not doing it properly if they're working, unless they're working 80 hours a week. They're not doing it properly if, you know, if they're not, um, I don't know what's another what's another thing that's going to escape me, but a, but a stereotype around what it means to be an entrepreneur, and and that might be saying to someone that might be almost glamorising the fact that you're really unhealthy, that you put on weight, 
that you're unfit and glamorizing that as a cost of being an entrepreneur. Um, and, and I, the hashtag hustle movement. Oh, exactly. the, the, the hustle hard. Hashtag hustle yeah. movement, absolutely. And, and yeah. so innovate with your, your mindset and innovate with your health in order to be a better, could be a better teacher or could be a better um, entrepreneur. And that's to say if you, rather than just dropping your personal relationships by picking one of Randy Zuckerberg's three out of five, you know, call a friend when you're out walking, for example. Um, do do ten push-ups, you know, you know, between you know what yeah, you know, whatever. Like do have have incremental and a, a micro approach to looking after yourself so that you can be the best teacher yes. possible, be the best entrepreneur possible. And and at all costs, try to avoid the the busy um, badge of honor. Mm. Because I honestly think that Absolutely. it's the most unevolved mindset when it comes to, um, like, how are you? I'm so busy. I'm so busy. Oh, well, if, you, if you're busy, you must be doing everything right. Um, we need to evolve from that mindset. And, and it's to say if you've got an empty inbox or if you've got a, a well-ordered task list where your to-do list doesn't make you sweat, your to-do list looks close to achievable each day, and then you reprioritize and hit the next day without that sense of anxiety in your stomach that your next day is going to be completely unachievable, that's being evolved and that's being the best possible um, operator when it comes to, uh, well, again, being an entrepreneur. And then you can apply it to being a teacher as well. And, and, and I've said it before, the teacher's cups are overflowing. Um, they need to find room to, to look after themselves uh, to be the best for our kids. Absolutely. You know, you've, you've reminded me, we're very lucky. We've just got someone to come in and help to outsource. And, and to your point, to put that not to do list together into action. And she's taught me, you've either got to do it, you got to diarize it, you got to delegate it, or just delete it and get really honest with what can Absolutely. go on the not to do. And Absolutely. I think for teachers as well, that point around, you know, do we need to strive for that exceptionality across every single playing field as we're walking through our days? Uh, a good mentor of mine, Dr. Susie Green, I remember her saying to me many years ago, you can have it all. You just can't necessarily have it all at once. And I like to think I'm striking a bit of a chord with that in the sense that I am working to have it all at once. And I'm also very conscious that not everybody's and everything's going to be exceptional at the same time. So Absolutely. yeah, People on that know. note, have you got time for a game yeah, to wrap some yeah. framework yeah. around this self-care piece? Because yes, I heard you with the, the things that are in our control are those daily habits around our physical health. Um, and sometimes there are things that are out of our control. And so leaving buckets with our not to do list can help to free up that time. But we love to draw on Martin Seligman's work with the wellbeing framework of PERMA. So I'm not sure if you've come across it, but it's basically an acronym we can all remember. So in addition to our H comes at the end, that's our physical health, but we're going to move through P-E-R-M-A, positive emotions, engagement, relationships, meaning accomplishment and physical health. Now, if that was too fast, do not stress because your fun sheet for this episode will be available in today's episode notes and you're free to go download that and take it into your personal or learning spaces. But let's whip through with Ben. This is a rapid fire, my friend, because I know you are very good at looking after yourself. Can I ask you, positive emotions, what fills that bucket for you? What brings you joy and contentment, laughter, Love. Yeah, look, just just having the kids around me, really. Um, our, the kids in our local environment, so that could be um, exercise, one of the best. Um, I sort of stumbled on this, but, you know, running or doing something that is sort of mindful that doesn't take a lot of thought yes. allows my thoughts to create an orderly cue. Um, love that and, and just have love having the kids around my ankles. <laughs> I know already that your buckets are all going to overflow into each other, yep. which is beautiful. <laughs> and that speaks to that entrepreneurial mindset. And they do, they can weave in. Okay, so engagement. So this is the idea of a sense of flow, things that really make you feel like time standing still and that you're matching your your abilities with a challenge. How about for you? I, I think and this is, the, this is the pandemic and the lockdown has taught me this. It, it's to, uh -huh. to work, um, work, think, exercise, um, to to do all those things at, at a time that is right for you and and your personality and your your, your worldview really and, and that's to say that um, you know I feel most engaged at what would traditionally be quite kooky hours of the day 
Um, I, I was talking about this to someone who's gone back to commuting to the city and just how disengaged they feel yeah. when they get off the bus after 45 minutes. Um, we're not uh-huh. all fortunate enough to have such control over our time. I am. And, um, and to get into that sort of, sort of flow state, so to speak, from a work perspective, um, it, it means that, you know, I'll preference a 9.30 workout um, at, the, at, the, at the surfer gym down the road and, and you hit the desk at 11 o'clock after a swim and just be firing on all cylinders and I guarantee you I'll get twice as much done um, thanks to that workout in traditional business hours than I would if I was subscribing to a nine-to-five approach. Amazing. It sounds like flow for you is that nice point between knowing where your time is and how your body clock works and doing those activities that just fill your buckets up, like the the physical exercise and being out in nature. What about relationships? How do you fill your relation bucket up? So you mentioned your kids and your family. Yeah, look, it's just it's just time. Um, uh, I, I love um, just, I love having an empty calendar. Um, I get no satisfaction out of being, out of telling people I'm busy. Um, I also <laughs> don't feel a great obligation to, you know, fill a weekend or, or fill an evening. Um, I have a lot of calls on my time. Um, I've gotten very good at saying no. And, um, and that's all to clear that space to fill my relationship bucket. And, and that could be, um, you know, just unscheduled time with Ali or the kids. Um, and, and also, you know, one of the things that is, is really important to me or that I really love is the ability just to what we say with kids, wait, watch and wonder. And, and that's to be sort of not scheduled or not planned and to let a, a walk that you thought was going to be half an hour turn into an hour and a half walk because – Kids are doing whatever they do, you know, exploring, creating, imagining. Um, to me, that's that's relationship fulfillment um, and, and it's making the space to be able to do that. High quality connections. And as somebody who knows you guard your time, I am forever grateful with the time you spend with <laughs> I us. Love it. What about your meaning? So you do your impact work. How, what brings you meaning on a day-to-day level? How do you fill that back up? Yeah, look, I, I get out of bed every morning um, and have done for 10 years thinking that if, if we don't provide a solution to help schools manage their relief teachers and to get our assistant principals, deputy principals um, off the phone and, and, and doing what they actually are meant to be doing, which is supporting our students, um, that if we don't do that via class cover, someone else will. And, and so mm-hmm. I'm driven to continue to always make what we offer schools and educators better. Um, and then, as you know, as we've talked about a bit today, that's expanded and it could be to support the teachers and that could be the teacher education. It could be to support the teachers with employment. It could be to support children who are in need um, of catch up learning. And and so that's, yeah, that that's absolutely what fulfills me. And then I've obviously been lucky enough to also really, again, flex that kind of educator muscle and blend it with the entrepreneurship to help people, how I say it, get from A to B faster or get from A to B cheaper um, or to fail fast and fail cheap to qualify out. Um, And I I love that. And and I do that by just sharing mistakes. And that's what I say. I I tell people I'm basically someone who um, is fortunate enough to get paid to tell people about the mistakes that, that I made and to try and help them not make them. And as a beneficiary again of that, I'm very grateful. <laughs> Last one, accomplishment, because we've kind of done health, haven't we? Your exercise, your sleep, your water, and that would be the H at the end for anyone who's getting into that tip sheet, but accomplishment. And I'm really curious because I think many people miss this, Mark, about the small wins, mm-hmm. celebrating those. How do you make space in your day? Yeah, look, that, that's that's almost a – that that pulls on so much of what we've talked about today. And, and again, go back to stereotypes. So – as a as a mm. stereotypical startup founder, um, you see so many people who love to signal and project that they're too busy to stop and celebrate, stop to reflect, um, stop to refine because they're, they're, there's just an endless to-do list and that's a waste of time. Um, now, celebrating and, and and marking achievement has many effects on a business 
um, not just for the mental health and the well-being of the founders or the owners, but but also on the product or service itself. Because yeah, you know, we talk about in in agile terminology about a retrospective, and and having a celebration and pausing to reflect allows you to refine how you'll do things better next time. And and absolutely. And, and so while you're clinking glasses and saying, "Hey, look, job well done, hundredth customer, job well done," you know, first capital raise, whatever it might be. Um, it's also a strategic upside to while you're having that the glass of champagne to be saying, hey, look, that was good, but we can make it better. And and you've mentioned creating space, um, you know, in, in the last hour or so. And and, I, and again, it's liberating time. It's making time. It's not being fixated with everything being constantly overflowing, but it's acknowledging that we need time as human beings to think. We need time for our thoughts to be put in an orderly queue. And if if you're constantly worried that it's going to be almost, you're going to be marked down as being an underachiever just because you give yourself a bit of time to go for a walk or a run or to, to have a glass of champagne with your, with your co-founder or your, or your team, then ultimately it's going to be your business or you personally that suffers. I love that. It's not just the well-being. It's also got an ROI on productivity. And I don't know about our listeners, but I can definitely share, Ben, that just speaking to you with the time that we have today, I feel like I have permission to breathe <laughs> in my day. I'm going to go and schedule my big long walk <laughs> and get back to the good stuff. Thank you for being a constant reminder of the things that matter most. Uh, ben, before I let you go, how can people follow your journey and, and get in touch with you, connect with you? classcover.com.au for the for the the main game so to speak um nothing nothing Perfect. happens without that business um and then uh yeah look you can i've got a unique surname grozier is pretty and there's not many of us and so you can find me on linkedin quick quick search and you'll find me i'm not the one in america that's the uh that's that's the clue but um yeah if you want to uh Good tip. Yeah. Definitely stalk him on LinkedIn because uh, there's lots of celebrations that go up and it's just been a pleasure following Class Cover's journey. I can't wait to see the next win as it goes. Well, that's all we've got time for today at Classroom 5.0. Thank you so much for listening. I'm your host, Marianne Power, and today we were joined by our guest, Ben Grozier. We'll see you later, alligators. Thanks very much, Liz.